enduring multiple cancers as a child not only left Catherine Gallant with an amputated leg, a knee replacement, and three lung surgeries, the associated treatments weakened her heart, leaving Catherine permanently impacted but not disabled. Growing up, this plucky woman graduated from one of the most respected colleges in America and began carving out a career in marketing with little experience, a can-do attitude, and a true passion for research. I'm on chemo at this time. Now they've pulled out the big guns, the seriously big guns, a drug called adriamycin, and they're using it in early days with adults. They start using it in kids. It's extremely toxic. And they knew at the time that it was toxic, but not exactly how much. And we now know there's a lifetime limit to the dosage you can use in a person. And we didn't know that at the time. And I've had like four times the limit. And they also didn't know that you couldn't co-administer adriamycin with uh, radiation, especially thoracic radiation. So they started doing thoracic radiation on me. And so adriamycin is highly cardiotoxic. Damaging to the heart. Yeah. So, and then it gets, it basically is potentiated by the radiation, which does Potentiated means it just makes it more worse. damaging. Exactly. So between those two things, before I'm done with treatment within the year, we know that I've sustained some serious damage to my heart. I have cardiomyopathy, which is essentially a damage to the cellular structure of the heart muscle, and the heart is enlarged. But it's not like a valve thing or something you can fix. It's the actual muscle of the heart is damaged. And it won't, it won't go back down. No. So cardiomyopathy leads to congestive heart failure. And so by the end of my, you know, my early adulthood, my 20s, I have chronic congestive heart failure, which I'll have for the rest of my life. So you have all the, so the two lungs, the two knees, you said... Then there's a third tumor in the lung, just to, so now it's July 1976, and there's a third tumor. And now I'm, now I know I'm dying. Like now, now I sink into a deep depression. I can't imagine how it's possible anybody's going to, you know, my statistically, <laughs> my number has to be up. So that surgery, that that was, you know, I went into that surgery, you know, and I didn't know. I just envisioned I'd die in the surgery. So what happens when you wake up and, and you're still alive? I was really surprised. I was pretty sure if there was a heaven, I was pretty sure it didn't look like an ICU unit. <laughs> but I still had treatment to go through. I still had to recover. And now I had a heart problem, so I was sick from that. And I went into a crisis about a month later with my heart like a crash. And how old were you by then? I was, I guess I must have been 12 or 13. There's no more cancer that is on the immediate horizon. You know that you have a heart condition that you're learning to manage as best you can. Do you go on from high school to college? I do. I get myself into Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. What did you major in? I majored in American Studies and my focus was in literary criticism. What does it qualify to do? Nothing. <laughs> it qualifies me to read things and think about things and write about things. Critical thinking. Critical thinking. You graduate and you said you'd started working on your career before you even graduated. Yeah, I got a job at a radio station in Hartford, Connecticut. This insane person, I, you know, hired me for some reason. His name is Dan Hayden. He's still my one of my beloved people in my life. What but was the job? It was basically whatever he wanted me to do. I did some uh, production, commercial production. I wrote commercials. I helped with promotions. How did you know how to do anything? I didn't know how to do any of it, which is why he hired me. When I ask him now, why on earth did you hire me? He said, you didn't have any bad habits. How long did you stay? I stayed there, for, I think, about a year and a half or two years. And then in 1989, I moved to Rochester to be with family there, my adopted family, who uh, there is a marketing communications agency. And I had, you know, been a marketing person in radio. I understood marketing. So I moved to Rochester and worked in that business. So I've been in marketing and marketing strategy, marketing communications ever since. So uh, at this point, you're 20... 24, 25. And one thing we didn't talk about, we talked about all your medical conditions and the medication and how it affected you and your heart and those things, but it also affected your growth. Right. So that you are only how tall? I'm five feet tall. And on my, a good day. On a very good day. <laughs> one day when my doctor was... I went in to see her and she was having a really bad day. She said, 
You know how we always sort of nod and smile that you're five feet tall? She goes, you're not. You're 4'11 and three quarters. And I'm changing it to that in your chart. I was like, all righty then. So I have a very good day. Standing tall. You're five feet. Five feet tall. And in addition to that, you have a prosthetic on one leg one and leg. another leg that doesn't bend. Right. So clearly, sitting at a desk, you look like everyone else. But if you stand up to walk into a meeting or to go to lunch with a client or anything like yeah. that, you're different. I walk with a cane. I have a weird gait. You know. Is I'm, it a problem? Uh, yes, it has been a problem. It's not really anymore because I'm old and I just don't care anymore. But when you started. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I was young, and I was a woman, and I'm small, and I was disabled. Occasionally there would be somebody who would be really dismissive. You know, clearly I couldn't possibly have a thought in my head. How did you deal with that? I always pissed off about it when I was young. Now, pardon my French, I just, for a lot of things, part of the luxury of getting older is you just don't give a fuck about a lot of things. Like, you just were like, I can't, that's them, you know. Um, not said. What are you going to do about it? You go and you're this marketing executive. How long are you in that job? I did that until 1992. And in 1992, I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. My I thought heart, they had told you that already. They knew that I had occasions of acute heart failure. But my normal day-to-day -day life, it, it wasn't a factor. You know, I exercised. I was not breathless. Um, I didn't have any symptomatology of heart failure. But in 1992, um, I thought I had a flu. And I couldn't, I couldn't breathe well, and I was having trouble. I gained 20 pounds in a month, and I was having trouble even getting from like my bedroom to the bathroom without being out of breath. And so I went to see my doctor, who I had just met, and you know, she said, if I didn't know your age, I would think that you were in heart failure. She sent me to the University of Rochester, to the oncology team there, the survivor's clinic. And the minute I walked in, they said, yep, heart failure. I was in the hospital for a while while they got me stabilized. And that's when I started being treated. Now I'm treated for the rest of my life for that. We started with pharmacology and did that for a very long time. It's a progressive disease. And, you know, I... Pharmacology means treating the congestive with heart drugs. failure with drugs. Yes, maybe about 10 years ago now, the, the disease was moving, progressing. And they got to the point where... I needed more advanced care, so I was transferred over to the heart failure and transplant program at the U of R. I'm not listed for a transplant, and I probably won't be a candidate if I ever do need a heart. But they put me on much more aggressive treatment, much, much closer control. And then about a year or two after that, we determined that I needed a device. A pace, it's called a biventricular pacing device. Pacemaker? It's a pacemaker, but it's a exotic pacemaker and it has a defibrillator in it. So let's back up. You have finished in marketing with the Rochester firm. Are you at a point where you start to think, okay, is this truly what I still want to do or do you just dive right in with another marketing company? I start to, I, I work for a small company in Rochester. It's a mail order company that, that manufactures and sells archival products to fine artists and photographers in museums. So I go there as a marketing communications director. I'm going to work there for a few years. Then I leave and I become a freelancer. And I do basically whatever it is that people have me do. Build strategies, write copy, design brochures. For the first year I made $100,000. Wow! Yeah, so I was pretty proud of myself. But the part I loved about all of this was when I got to do research. i have been a researcher in college and I loved interviewing people. By this point, I started to realize research is what I love. And so, you know, talk about talking things into existence. I'd meet people and they'd say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a market researcher. <laughs> <laughs> because that was going to be the reality that you wanted That's to do. That's what I wanted to do. So they'd say, well, do you think I need market research? And I'd say, of course you do. Doesn't everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, they liked me or something and they'd hire me. And then I'd learn how to do market research. I got hired by this wonderful woman in Rochester, a woman named Chris Pelline, who ran a fairly large advertising agency. She was a brand planner and a, the head of the agency. She was fascinated by research, too. And I think she must have known I didn't know Jack about this. But, you know, I had all the right energy, and I wasn't completely stupid. I had done some. 
And so um, she hired me to do a bunch of stuff. And I learned, I learned on the job. And Did you I, make mistakes? A lot of mistakes. But I'd always come back from the field with good stuff.